today I'm sitting with Suzanne Giesman. Suzanne served as a commanding officer in the U.S. Navy and as the aide to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff during the time of 9-11. She now serves as a metaphysical author and teacher, bringing hope and inspiration to humanity. Countless lives have been utterly transformed by Suzanne's work, which entails teaching people how to live each day in a fully awakened state. Suzanne, I'm so happy that you're joining me today. I'm so excited for this. Oh, so, Stephen. Hello. <laughs> Great to talk with you. I just love your energy. We've talked before and, and you and I are on the same page. So thank you. Oh, I love being on that page with you. Um, so people watching this recording have just seen Living with Ghosts and are very eager to learn from someone with your skills. But before we go there, let's talk a little bit about why someone who has reached the pinnacle of her chosen career, and for you that was serving in the US military, a group that's steeped in the physical properties of our world. How do you go from that to being a rising star as a metaphysical teacher? Well, as I've learned for many people, that big shift in focus comes about, unfortunately, through a major life change. And in my family, that was the very unexpected and tragic death of my stepdaughter, Susan. She was a sergeant in the Marine Corps. She was seven, no, six months pregnant, was crossing the flight line on the Marine Corps base where she was stationed mm -hmm. and was struck and killed by lightning. Wow. Found out that's actually more common than you would think. But at the time, we just found it unimaginable that she was gone. Then we lost our grandchild at the same time. But what was even more unimaginable to me was looking at her body at the viewing and believing that she was gone forever. It wasn't just a thing that we say, I can't believe she's gone forever, Stephen. It was a knowing that there is a spark of something in all of us, call it the spirit, that has to live on. I just knew it. I wasn't talking in terms of soul and afterlife at that time, spirit beings, but that knowing I know now came from my soul. So that started me on a whole different journey than one I had been on at that point in my life. So are you saying that at that moment, you felt like in a way you gave birth to something or was it always there in kind of a dormant state and this kind of sparked? Well, I will tell you that I had been drawn to books about the afterlife throughout my life. I found it fascinating reading about mediums who could talk to people across the veil people who channeled message, always intrigued by that and read a lot of it, but it was just theory. And so when I saw Susan's lifeless body and just knew that's not her, I decided then and there to see if I could connect with her spirit. Not knowing how to do it, I began meditating that very week. And this was 2006 when meditation was still a little bit fringy. I'd been retired three years by that point, and my husband and I were living on our sailboat. We, we had decided after 9-11, go off and live our dreams. And we were doing that. I basically ran away from life after 9-11 and my personal experiences on that date with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. But life caught up to me. And that inner knowing again that I needed to, to create some silence if I was going to connect with her is what led me to meditate. And that practice changed my life. So let's talk a little bit about that. Okay. You started meditating? Yeah. And, okay. and no training whatsoever. And I didn't, unusual, unusual for me, I didn't go do all the research. I just sat quietly every day and it sounded so funny to say to my husband, Ty, I'm going to go meditate now. But he, he honored my, my mission of connecting with Susan. So I would go in the aft cabin on our boat and sit on the bed and just get quiet and say, Susan are you here? Susan, I want to connect with you. And then I would just be quiet. And I have to tell you the first three weeks, I fell asleep every single time because my body was not used to resting. I'm not a nap person. I'm always going, going, going. And I stuck with it though. I was determined. But the thing that surprised me was I did not feel Susan. It took several years till I had a incredibly irrefutably clear connection with her. So I succeeded in that. 
But along the way, because of that practice of sitting in the silence daily without fail, I started opening up my awareness. My intuition came back online. I know we're all born with it. That's why I say back online. And I knew things about people. I knew things that were going to happen. And I started to connect with, I can only call them higher beings who were giving me information that I had no way of knowing. So I was just fascinated by what I call adventures in consciousness that I didn't expect. And I stayed with it. So what is the, what is the tip off? Like when you're hearing those voices, when I hear them, I'm always debating, okay, is that me or is that my higher self? But I, I, I can't, I don't feel confident yes. that it's, so how, what, what's different for you when it's, it's definitely a spiritual being? You learn through practice to discern the difference between your own thoughts and those that are put there by higher consciousness. The most important key is that it's fresh and different and stands out from the normal noise in your head. And then the second test is, is it helpful in healing? Because many times it will sound exactly like your own thoughts. So you act on what you hear. If it's helpful, wonderful. Give thanks, even if you think it came from you. And more, the more often you do this, then you start noticing, I never would have thought of that. And you realize you're part of an interactive conversation with non-physical helpers. Okay, now I went to your website and I found that there was a link to something called, you know, the awakening way. Or the awakening way. way. The awakening okay. way. And I did something called SIP, which is sit in peace. Yes. Okay. And I I tried that. And first of all, I love how condensed that is. Cause I I somebody like me needs that. Yeah, let me just say it's it's a three minute meditative practice right. called sip of the divine that I was guided to share with people. As you said, sip stands for sit in peace because everybody makes excuses. I don't have time for meditation. I can't sit still that long, but anybody can take three minutes a day and it will change your life because it's not only a practice in focus and noticing the thoughts as they pass through and disappear, but you get to ask a question each time you do it. And that way, every time you, you notice what kind of answer you get. Okay. Now I, when I listened to it, I heard you talk about instructions that you received from higher divine beings for this particular practice. Right. But do they speak to you in English? Do they speak to you? Do they form pictures in your head? Like I need like Somebody like me, again, needs like details, like what, how did that happen? So it comes in whatever way I'm most receptive to at the moment. And it'll be the same for anybody who does the practice. You could see images, you could hear very clear sentences, or you could just know. That's optimal. Those instructions, most likely, because I don't remember, came in thoughts that I wrote down as I received the instructions. Mm -hmm. The key to when you get any input is to pull the thread, engage whoever sent you that information. Even if you don't see them or sense them, say, mm -hmm. oh, that's interesting what I just sensed. Tell me more, or I don't understand this, or why are you showing me an image of a ship's wheel? What does that mean? And you start to realize you're having a conversation with a sentient being. Wow, that's crazy. So <laughs> Crazy, so, wonderful. I, I mean, yes, yes. Yeah. Now, I've been kind of in a spiritual space for a long time. And I'm one of those people that, I keep on referring to myself as one of those people, but I guess I am one of those people. <laughs> I'm one of those people that really wants it. Yeah. And don't feel like I have, sometimes it, I, guess, I think I just lose confidence that I can get there. Uh -huh. You were able to just, dedicate yourself to this practice without for, for a, quite a while without getting that feedback. So how long was it before you started to feel like, okay, something is happening. I am, I'm getting, I'm getting a message and I, I feel it. Well, something started happening within, I would say six weeks. I can remember the moment I was sitting on somebody else's boat and they started telling us, Oh, we're from Wisconsin. And I thought, isn't that interesting? I sense Michigan around them. And then I brought that up and they said, oh, we actually are from Michigan, but we just moved to Wisconsin. And I, and I thought, how did I know that? 
So that's just picking up to the one field of information that we all share. And I didn't realize it was the effect of this expansion of consciousness on a daily basis. But more and more experiences like that happen. One thing I, I want to back up here, Steve, and emphasize is that from the very beginning, because of my left brain military background, I have asked for evidence. Prove it to me that this is real. So when I get a message, when I get some kind of insight or information, I test those who are giving it to me. What kind of sign are you going to send me that I can trust this interaction? Then whatever pops into my mind, I remain open to that. And within a day or three, I have the most magical encounter with whatever sign I was shown. So it's it's a game I play. I call it the sign game. But it shows that you're willing at least to play with this, to believe, to be open to possibilities. And the more you do that, you'll find yourself having more magical moments. You know, I was worried that testing wasn't allowed. Oh, gosh. Because, <laughs> but here's what happened. Maybe you could tell me, make sense of this. When I was filming, and people probably remember who Ethel is. Ethel is the automatic writer. Yeah. Who, who corresponds with her late husband, Bailey. Her late husband's name is Harold. So in one of my, I think it was my very first interview, I wanted to test if Harold was real or in Ethel's imagination. So I, I got a deck of cards and I, I was looking at the deck of cards, at the bottom card of the, of the deck, but not showing it to Ethel. And I said, Ethel, could you ask Harold what card I'm looking at right now? And then, and I had been speaking with Harold for a little while, just some pleasantries. <laughs> um, but, that, but Ethel said, oh, Harold does not like this. He doesn't want to oh. be tested. Uh -huh. So I said, why, why is that? And she said something like, that's a negative, it emits a negative charge, just like being tested made him feel, I guess, like I wasn't open to the process. So I felt like I was worried that I couldn't do that again. Okay, let's put this in different terms. They want us to know they're here, those across the veil, our loved ones who have passed, our helpers at the higher levels. The energy that we put out when we say we want this specific piece of evidence, I want you to tell me what this card is, that is a totally different energy than, Harold, what sign can you send me that you know I will receive? Do you feel the openness in that? And I can tell you that I had this exact teaching from my team recently because I have had some of the most stunning moments where a higher being said, get out your tarot deck. I don't read tarot cards. That's just a, it's just a fun thing that I have for this very purpose, for validation. And this being said, you will pull the Hierophant card. There are 78 cards. I spread them out upside down with utter knowing this would happen. I turned it over and it was the Hierophant. Three, six months later, I don't know how much longer. I had another being come in and said, do it again. You will pull the emperor card. In this case, I doubted. My human fear came in and I reached down and I didn't pull the emperor. I actually pulled a card, the nine of swords, which is all about fear and waking up from a bad dream. And the lesson was when you're in fear, when you doubt this connection, it is like being in a dream. And I heard, what did you know before? when you pulled the Hierophant? And I replied, I knew I was going to pull it. And they said, make that shift into knowing. It's a different level of consciousness than the normal human consciousness. Make that shift, step back in, into that divine power and you will pull the emperor. And Stephen, I knew, I knew it was going to happen. I got goosebumps reliving that moment. And I just shifted my focus. This is what I teach people in the awakened way, how to access that knowing. And I looked down, totally different change in energy from a few minutes earlier. And I went like that. I turned it over and it was the emperor. Now, see, that's when higher consciousness knows we're aligned. We're doing this for the right reasons. They will guide us to the signs. But when we do it from our human terms, you got to prove it to me. Totally different energy. Mm. 
Wow, first of all, that's that's an eye opener. Thank you for making that distinction for me. Yeah. Just for anybody who's listening who's wondering if like Harold was just copping out and worried that he wasn't going to pass the test. Um, after this incident, um, Ethel said, Harold does not want to answer your question. I see two of spades in my head, if that helps. And it was the two of spades <laughs> I was looking at. So at least Ethel, right. Ethel, Ethel passed the test. <laughs> yeah, but that's because we're all part of one mind. This, right. That's the non-dual nature that I've come to learn about all of this. We actually are, exist along an entire spectrum of consciousness. And where we put our focus determines our reality. So right now we're talking human to human, but I could shift and talk soul to soul, which is what I do in a reading when I, I actually connect people with their loved ones now on a regular basis. And I connect soul to soul with those who have crossed. But ultimately I know that there is only one mind, the absolute, and all of us are projections, emanations of that one mind. So you, you just dance and flow with the appropriate state of awareness at any one time. And it just opens up life in the most wondrous ways. And it's so freeing to be outside of the normal human mindset. Right. So you're, you're saying that we are basically all sharing the same consciousness. That's yeah. the water we're swimming in. Yeah. Right. right yeah. Right. Yeah. The sea of consciousness. Right. So, and, and that's why it's things like telepathy make sense when you put it in those terms, we don't have consciousness. We are consciousness. We're from consciousness. We're all that's right. And your intention pulls from the entire field exactly the information that you're intending to receive or the experience. So when I want to connect with someone's loved ones who have passed, now that once I did it with Susan and then found out that I could do it with other people's loved ones, I've dedicated my life to finding out how we can connect with anyone and higher beings and how it works. So all I do is I sit, my clear intention is for healing and comfort to the person I'm sitting with. And I know that what will do that is being able to validate that this is their loved one who is here. So we don't just get beautiful, loving messages. Yes, they're here and they're beautiful and they loved you. We would get, this is, this is your husband. He's showing me he passed from an aneurysm in the, that burst in his head. He shows me he spent a little bit of time in the military. He's showing me that his Favorite pastime was puttering around on his lawn tractor, you know, things like that. And then the messages that we get, and he wants you to know that he's perfectly fine and he's around you more than you know, can't validate that. But the validations that came before it lend credence to that. I see, I see. So Suzanne, I want to go back just a little bit because I'm picturing you with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I'm picturing you in a helicopter Oh, on 9-11, like surveying damage. I know I read a little bit about your background. Yeah, and... Could I just, just back up a bit? I was actually on a jet with the chairman going to England. He was going to be knighted by Queen Elizabeth. Okay. We found out about the attack several hours out over the Atlantic. We turned around to come back to Washington. By that time, every other aircraft in U.S. airspace had been grounded, and our our jet was the last one in U.S. airspace. We flew right over Manhattan, had bird's eye view of the smoking towers and flew back to Washington, D.C. and went into the still smoking Pentagon. So it was profound. So you pretty much had a front row seat to probably what might be the most publicized and horrific event in human history. I mean, it was it was huge. And you were with people who are making important decisions. So I'm just wondering, here you are, a high-ranking military person, and you're in suddenly interested in this metaphysical universe. That must have been a pretty wild shift to have to explain to any, anyone. Well, it, it took several years after I retired until I made the complete shift. And when I did talk to my former colleagues, most of them were very open to it, Stephen, because they knew me and they knew my integrity and they knew that I wouldn't just make up stories. And if people are honest, they want to know about the afterlife. We all have this interest in these types of things. The one person who wasn't open to it was the chairman himself. And I get that. He was raised in a very, very uh, uh, 
dogmatic religion and it just wasn't part of his belief system. And I honor that completely. I've never tried to change anybody's mind. I share if they're open to it, these experiences. I show people anybody can learn to tap into other aspects of higher consciousness. So if people are open to that, I absolutely emphasize asking for evidence because for me, that's what changes lives. You said I, I, I influence people these days. I just came from speaking at a conference with 900 bereaved parents and Stephen, dozens of them, almost everyone who came up to me to comment on my work said, you have, you saved my life. You saved my life. They all had a child who passed. They were in the deepest of depression. I know those moments. And many of them were just ready to leave the planet and join their kids. And finding out that there is a way to connect with our children and to do so with evidence and to receive evidence from others who do this work with integrity, it is life-changing and life-saving. Yeah, that's really rewarding to hear for you and for anyone in this work, when you're having that kind of an impact. I mean, I'm fortunate enough to get, I'm getting a taste of that with this film. Oh, People your film seeing it. Your film is so amazing. When I saw it, I was so thrilled that somebody uh, showed both sides in a balanced way of this issue to let people make up their own minds. But if, if you are open-minded, how can you watch a film like yours right. and not want to know more, at least? Yes, and, and just to, um, to relate to what you were saying, it is so wonderful to hear that people are getting this information and they're deciding to live. I mean, that's a huge, great, wonderful thing. And that's why both of us are in a hurry to kind of get this, this message out there. Yeah, and, and not just live, Stephen, but live lives of joy again. That's the thing. You would think that a conference with 900 bereaved parents would be depressing completely the contrary. First of all, we don't call ourselves bereaved parents. We have a term, it's a shining light parent because our kids are our shining lights. And after a while, as we come to know they're still part of our lives and we engage them in conversation throughout our day, not just to make us feel better, but because of the signs they send us, the sense of presence we get from them, then our light shines again and we become a shining light for those who are new on this path. So the people in that conference, they had found their people. They had found other people who have been where they are, who the new ones, you know, they, they've been through that grief and they're smiling again. That's what we want. We want to know we, we can be happy because our kids are okay across the veil. Same with any loved one. And that's what your film helps to show people. I love the automatic writing. It works. I teach it. Anybody can learn to do these methods. Great, thank, thank you for saying that. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you this question. So people are sometimes talking to me as if I'm a therapist just because I made a movie. They think <laughs> I'm like an expert from the film. I'm not, well, I'm the guy behind the camera, right? Yeah, but you picked up a lot over the years that you <laughs> made that film. <laughs> and people will talk to me by email, let's say, and they'll ask me, and you, you could tell these people are in terrible pain and they want to know what to do. Like, what? how can I, where should I point them? Now, you're someone that actually helps people help themselves, which yes. is a huge gift to yes. be able to give. Now, somebody sees, and here's where I'm going to ask you, what do, what do I tell people and what do you tell people? Because when people are that in that place, they don't want to wait to get an appointment to do like either um, to see a medium or to, uh, to do the IADC that's featured in the film. Right. They want to know what they can do right now and do okay. on a daily basis. So okay. wh where do I start? What do you do? Okay, I, I was given by my guides the three E's to hope and healing. And that's educate yourself. So watch Stephen's film, read all you can about near-death experiences, about the afterlife, watch YouTube videos. I have about 200 on my YouTube channel that will educate you lots of books, all kinds of things. Read, 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 watch videos, learn all you can. That's the first E. The second one is experience for yourself, expanded states of consciousness. And the third one is in those expanded states, engage higher consciousness. 
And not, those, that is not linear. You can be doing all three at once. You're reading a little, then you go into a meditation and you sense somebody, you engage them. You're, you're driving in your car and you sense a presence, engage them. That's an experience. Then you go back to reading and watching videos. You can learn from many teachers, but I've dedicated myself over the past dozen years to this. And if you go to my homepage, down at the bottom is an e-guide that's actually called, Where Do I Begin? And it has this whole menu of resources that I've created, at least half of them absolutely free, many of them on the gifts page of my website. And they include meditations and binaural beats to help you drop into a a more expanded state of consciousness, what to read, videos to watch, and support groups. It's just, uh, it's a journey. And if everybody could trust that you will be guided perfectly for your unique journey by setting the intention to be guided, just watch how it unfolds. Yeah, it's wondrous. It's, it's really fantastic that so much on your website is free. That shows me and other people that your intentions are divine intentions. So thank you. Yeah. On behalf of on behalf of humanity. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, I'm I'm excited because we're about to release an, a free app for smartphones. And the developer developed it for free because my work helped him so much. And as he's putting all this information in the app, he he said, this is so powerful. It should come preloaded on smartphones, which just cracked me up, but it is free. It's called The Awakened Way, and it contains daily inspiration. I get messages. I've had over 4,000 of them over the years from higher consciousness about how to live life more peacefully, to have happiness in your life, to find a connection with your own loved ones across the veil. All of that will be in the app. All of it's on my website every day. It's it's something I can't not do, Stephen. So I just love to share it liberally. Thank you. It's great. And you also have a podcast, right? I do. I do. It's called the Messages of Hope podcast. It's on all the major podcast stations. And we also video it these days. So it's also on my YouTube channel. We do Q&A sessions where I tune in and get answers from higher consciousness on the spot. And I bring in good guests. You were on it, in fact. I was on it. And right around that time, I saw a film with that same name. And if anybody wants to know a little bit about how you got more about how you got started, that film pretty much is it. That's you. It's completely autobiographical. And it's the true story of how Suzanne Giesman got to be Suzanne Giesman, right? Yeah, Messages of Hope. Thanks to Chris Lavelle for a beautifully professionally done documentary that has helped a lot of people. It's really a fantastic film. And now if people, is that available to people? How do they get oh, yeah. to see that? They can find a link through my website. It's on YouTube, Messages of Hope, Suzanne Giesman, and it's on Amazon Prime. You can watch it on the big screen. Fantastic. Now, now getting back to people who are in severe grief, are, are, you, are you saying that even if I'm in that despondent state, I know that for cer certain kinds of therapies, like the IEDC therapy featured in the film, the therapist would warn that if you're clinically depressed, the therapy is just not going to work. <laughs> are there states of mind that are just not helpful for trying to connect? Oh, absolutely. And I use the analogy of a traffic light because those in the spirit world need our energy to be open, to be able to connect with us so that we hear them and get their guidance and feel their love. So a red light would be just in a, in a total state of depression or on some kind of mood altering substance or just plain we don't believe and we're doubters, we're closed minded. That's a red light to connecting across the veil. A yellow light is, well, I, I think there's something to this. I'll give it a try. I'm not feeling on top of my game, but we'll see what happens. And then a green light is a playful childlike attitude I'm open to anything that's helpful and healing. I'm going to check to validate that this is accurate, but here I am. I'm filled with gratitude, loving feelings, high vibes, sending that out to you. Let's do this. You feel the difference. So if I'm under the weather or I've had something that's kind of knocked me off balance in my normal human story that I'm living here, I might postpone a session with somebody a day or so. But there are tools that I teach that 
you can you can shift your mood in an instant. So I don't want anybody listening who's in deep grief to feel that you you can't connect. Grief, as we all know, comes in waves. So when you're in the trough, don't try. Pamper yourself. Feel it. You have to go through that process. If you just push it aside because you're so eager to talk to your loved one, you're just delaying the inevitable and it might be worse later. So feel the grief. And then when you're feeling better, do a meditation, expand your, your consciousness and continue to work on clearing out any blockages in yourself that are keeping your light from shine. Wow, fantastic. Here's a question that just popped into my head. Maybe it was from the knowing. No doubt that's what happens. <laughs> but do you... Do you consider yourself like here's that story where you're, you know, you're at the funeral and you're, you get that message. Do you consider yourself just a regular person that just learned this and anybody can follow in your footsteps? Or do you think because of your background or because of whatever other reasons, because you have a leadership quality that you were actually given a little bit of a push? Oh, I know that. So Stephen, so I do know that all of us have the ability to connect with our own loved ones and possibly other people's loved ones, because that's a soul's ability. And we are all souls right here and right now. But there's no doubt in my mind, the way this has unfolded, that this is my calling, that it was some plan before I even came in a body. The way I look back at my life and how I, I was put into positions and, and earned positions that took me right to the top. I was a special assistant to the head of the Navy for one tour as well, the, the head honcho. And then to be the, the right-hand woman to the, the head of the entire United States Armed Forces. And it, the magical way that came about, I mean, I did earn it, but to be in the right place at the right time and just know this was meant to be. Looking back, I see that I had to have that story. So people who are skeptical, who would never believe in something like this, listen to this story and say, okay, at least now I'm open. I'll try it for myself. So it's, it's definitely a calling. It's also my, my, uh, well, my husband would call it my obsession to get better and better at this because it's so important to me that people understand how real this connection we all have with all that is, is I would call it my burning desire <laughs> rather than obsession. Okay, so Suzanne, earlier you mentioned something called the Awakened Way. Could yes. you tell me a little bit more about what that is and how it works? Yes, I had the honor of telling the story of a young man who's across the veil now named Wolf. His nickname was Wolf. Michael Pasacarnas was his name when he was in human form. And he came through in wondrous ways that left no doubt that we are souls and that sometimes the soul even knows how and when and where we're going to pass. I put that in a book. I wrote his story. The book is called Wolf's Message. But the teaching that he came back to share with all of us is profound. Basically, that we as a species are out of balance and that the time is right, right now, for us to come into balance and learn exactly who we are and why we're here. The teaching that he shared has come together into this way of living that I was told to call the awakened way. And it boils down to three very simple principles. Number one is you are not only human. And that's what we've been talking about this time together, Stephen. So if we're not only human, who are we? Well, you are a soul playing a role and you are the all that is expressing itself as a soul and as a human. So that's number one, you're not only human. Number two, you're part of one big web connecting all that is. You start to see that in synchronicities here at this human level, but once you start expanding your consciousness, you see how those across the veil are helping us and are part of this web as well. And number three, the creative force of the universe is love. When you align your intentions, your very being with unconditional love, Life just flows. You become a master manifester without even trying when your sole purpose is to bring more love into this world. So when you can live your life in accordance with those three principles, it's transformational. You find you're living a life of love. I get these daily messages, as I said, and they end every message with, you are so very loved. To come to know that is just a joy beyond anything I ever knew. 
this work, the awakened way, it takes you from this emptiness that most humans are well familiar with. It's an emptiness that can't be filled to a fullness that honestly, Stephen, can't be contained. We all want that. And it's all possible when you start to understand how to live this way. That's my goal, to have more and more people feel that fullness. I, I joke sometimes, but it's absolutely true. And, and talking to you now, I'm in that state right here. I just want to spew love all over everyone. And, and it's a love that I never knew back when I wore my military uniform. It's a, it's a, it comes from that oneness that you, you experience for yourself the more you immerse yourself in these expanded states of consciousness. And you go from basically asleep to fully awake or are there gradations in between? Oh, there are absolutely gradations. And even once you awaken, you, you, you slip back and forth. It's like a flying fish, right? You can only hold yourself up at those higher states for so long while you're in this body because the body is programmed to act certain ways and human ways. And so, so it's all about self-survival. But you can maintain that awareness in the back of your mind and then remain as awake as you can. And then when you slip back into human mode, it's so apparent because you've tasted that sweeter state and you want nothing more than to stay up there. And so it becomes the majority of your time, you're, you're living in those more awakened states. You're acting that out. I call it the sweet spot, the lucid zone, somewhere between your human self and the pure self, pure being. If you can stay in that lucid zone, that's good. I got you. And people are also seeking you out because you you offer like mediumship classes. Is that right? I do. Yeah. But I teach I teach people how to do sessions for other people. And then I also teach a class called personal mediumship, personal mediumship plus. A personal mediumship plus is how to connect with your own loved ones. They're, that's for people who have no interest in doing sessions for other people. And the plus is the deeper metaphysics that really explain how this is possible. You really flourish with this work when you understand the oneness underneath all of it. Okay, so let's say I attend one of your classes. I want to learn how to connect myself not for others, but for me, I want to connect to someone. Mm -hmm. um, so what's the first thing in that class? Did you say to go over the three E's or do you say something? What do you say usually in these classes? Well, this the beautiful part about my background is I love processes and systems. That's a nod to the left brain side of all of us. To find that balance between left brain processes and right brain flowing is optimal. So I... When I decided I was going to teach, thanks to a little push from my husband, I looked at what it is that works and what is it that I do. And I came up with specific processes for connecting systems that are not rigid, not rote, yet take you from normal waking consciousness to the optimal state for connecting. And because military people love acronyms, most of my processes have acronyms. And I, I put it out there for anybody uh, this one is, uh, again, free. You can go on to uh, YouTube or my gifts page on my website and find seven steps to connecting with higher consciousness. It's my bless me method where B-L-E-S-S-M-E -S -S is the process, the seven steps. So I won't go into it now. We don't have the time, but it's very simple. And tens of thousands of people are using it now with great success. I understand that we don't have a lot of time, but if I were to ask you to walk me through something, just because I want people who are watching this to know step-by-step step what they can do right now yeah, to make right them now. feel like they're connecting. Sure, we'll go right back to that sip of the divine because it's so simple. Just understand that you, you have different aspects of you, like the dream state, the normal waking state, the expanded state. So we wanna to go to the expanded state with the intention of getting the answer to a question from someone in the higher levels, doesn't matter whom, who has the bigger picture and knows what you need to know right now. So all you would do with that intention is first get centered, grounded. That means present. And you do that with a nice, deep, slow breath. When you breathe out longer than you breathe in, you trigger the body's relaxation response. So we just do a nice, slow breath, perhaps to the, into the count of four, out to six, like this. You can do it with me. 
in through the nose and out through the mouth. Now, just like that, I feel so much more relaxed, very peaceful. Now, I would want to not think this through too much. So I literally visualize my awareness sinking from the head into the loving heart area. And from this place, I shift my channel, like picking up a remote control, shift to the higher realms. And that's all it takes. If you believe it's so, and it is, and you ask the question, what do I need to know right now? You ask it quietly with your eyes closed. And now that you've put it out there, let it go and just be this blank screen of awareness and spend the next three minutes noticing what arises in awareness. You'll notice your to-do list come up. It's like a cloud in the blue sky. Let it go through. Be quiet again. You may hear an answer that you didn't expect. And that's when you'd say, tell me more. What does that mean? But we don't want to get right into a big conversation. Really, this is all about creating space, creating silence, training yourself to be peaceful, calm, and present. So you would have set a timer for three minutes. When that timer ends, you give thanks for whatever you received. And maybe go look up something about, you know, Google whatever you heard when you asked, what do I need to know now? Or make a note of that and just get on with the rest of your day. I really like that. I, I feel like it's very simple and straightforward. And the three minute parameters makes it very palatable for somebody Absolutely. like me. Yeah, that's uh, right. I, I need that, yeah. that short block. And you can yep. do that multiple times a day, right? Oh, yes. And in fact, I had a kindergarten teacher write to me. She said she has her students doing it and they love it. So we're starting them off young and, and right. I love that. Wait, wait, why are kindergartens getting excited about it? There's no toys involved. <laughs> yeah, because, because they feel the peace. They're getting answers themselves. Kids are already connected to where they just came from. Right, it's right. right around age seven that they start to lose that connection. So, hey, they get a chance to talk to their their friends and nobody says that's just your mind. Oh wow, that's that's great. Yeah. Now, if I let's say I have multiple people who are on the other side. If I want to try this and I want to like speak to one or more of these people, am I beckoning them by name or am I letting whoever wants it to, to talk to me step forward? Do it both ways cuz both ways work. I I lead guided meditations and it's nice to have somebody in mind or uh, do the 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 very common meditation where you get into that expanded state and you can visualize a beautiful meeting place with a bench and you sit on the bench and you invite whoever can communicate with you in this moment to sit with you. One thing I love to do with them, our loved ones, is say, once you sit down beside me, flood my mind with long forgotten memories. Oh, it's amazing the things that come up. Now, some people might say, oh, you're just opening up your subconscious. Now, see, that's a yellow light to the spirit world. That's human stuff. Why are you doing this? You want that connection. So honor what they give you and then see how you feel. Do you feel that presence? Does it feel loving? Who could ask for more than that? And do you typically say your, your invitations? Let's say, I want, let's say I want to talk to my dad. Yeah. Um, how should I... How should I extend? I guess I need the words. Like, what, what should oh, I say? Yeah, that's so funny because I just taught, led a big retreat. I had about 200 people and I was showing them how to set an intention. And this lady said, could you say that again? Because it was beautiful and I want to write those words down. And I said, you know, the words aren't important. It's the intention. You could just as easily say, hey, guys, this is what we want to do. Help me with that. <laughs> so you want to talk to your dad. It's coming from the heart. They don't use words across the veil, Stephen. It's all telepathic. It's all energy, frequency, sound, light, whatever you want to call it. It's not words, but you can use words and just say, dad, I'm creating some time here to sit with you. Come on in and sit close. Let's talk. Just like that. You know, that's, that's super helpful because if I kind of just realize that the words aren't important, and I'm a guy who loves words. I yeah. love the differences between different synonyms. 
Me too. I, Me too. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I try to come up with the exact perfect synonym for the particular phrase I'm trying to say. And I spend way too much time being pedantic in that way. Mm. So I love the idea of saying, okay, Steve, nobody could hear your words. They're just hearing your energy, your intention, your frequency. And then I feel like, okay, I could probably make my, I could always come up with the perfect energy for what I want. Well, let right? me tell you a fascinating story you just reminded me of. 12 days after the astronaut Edgar Mitchell crossed the veil after he died, a friend of his asked me if I would try to connect with him. So I sat with the friend here and I just said, Edgar Mitchell, our intention is to talk with you. Please be present and give me some evidence that this is really you. Oh my goodness. I described his personality that was not at all what I expected. The friend said, oh yeah, that's him. I described things about his passing that I didn't know, but the friend could validate. He showed me, Edgar, showed me things in his house that the friend could validate, all kinds of information. Then Edgar started talking to me in what I call burst transmissions. Boom, it was just an, a thought form that I had to unravel word by word to share it with the friend, but I knew what he was saying. And what was fun was I would answer him without words, just a burst. And then Edgar said to me, without words, what we're doing is like slapping a hockey puck back and forth to each other. Then he went double meaning and I knew what he meant. I turned to his friend and I said, Edgar was explaining this way we're communicating without words. He likened it to a hockey game. And he tells me that you just had an experience with a hockey game. And the man looked at me stunned. He said, Suzanne, I have a house guest. I hate sports of any kind, especially hockey. But last night we had to do something. So I took this guy to a hockey game and I sat there in the bleachers, bored to tears. So I sat there thinking about Edgar and said, are you really here? Wow. That's what I'm talking about, evidence. That's but, evidence, yes. yeah. Yeah, but helpful too, because it shows just what we were talking about. You don't need words. It was fascinating. We had a whole conversation without any words, just knowing. Ooh, goosebumps. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. First, so let's say I'm a grieving parent and I put out all this energy towards my child, loving energy towards my child, you're saying that I'm going to feel love back in some way. The more you're open to it. And the thing is, Stephen, our loved ones are all around us anyway. Once you come to understand there's one field of consciousness, there is only here in consciousness. There's not some far off discrete physical field called heaven. It's different frequencies, which is why I said you shift the channel. You know, when you shift the channel on your TV, do you go to some place or do you pull a discrete signal out of the air, air, out of the field? Yes, that's what happens. So your loved ones are right here, just at a different channel. Just by thinking of you, they're with you. When you think of them, you're with them. I had evidence that my stepdaughter was hanging out watching a funny incident that I was involved with. I had no idea she was even here. And I usually can notice her, but another medium brought up exactly what my stepdaughter sensed in that moment. And I went and I talked to Susan later. I said, how is it I didn't know you were here? She said, we're always here. You're just so used to my energy, you don't notice. Like the hair on your head, Stephen. You don't notice the hair on your head. You're just used to it until the wind blows, right? So I know this is almost impossible to articulate, perhaps. But what did it feel like for, what does it feel like for Susan to be near you? Let me ask. What's the difference? I'm asking. She says it's like a ripple in awareness. That's your light. Did you see that little lip twitch right there? I did think you I see did. That? That's, I can't replicate that for you. But when I tune into spirit and they're right here and they want me to trust it, they do that. It's automatic. It's so cool. But it's, wow. it's not impossible to answer. When you know they're right here, always, you just ask. So I just asked her and she said, it's a ripple in awareness. It's your frequency. Okay, now she It's like a doorbell goes off. So she responded to you, with pure, to you with pure energy and you're using the word ripple, which is very, it's very visual. Yeah. 
and it's very easy for me to get a mental picture that now that you've used that word, but how did you get that word? It first comes as a concept and then the brain without effort gives a word to it. Did you, did you see in your brain a ripple? Only after it came out of my mouth, the word ripple. So it's that's that the way fast. The, that's the way the brain works, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. Anybody can do this. It's just setting the intention and training yourself to notice what's here. You say I, that anybody can do that. And I've heard that before from various people in this field, but I think I need more encouragement. Like, why do you think I can do this or anyone can do this since, you know, well, you, are... you, you must have the intention or it's not going to unfold. Belief and intention. Those are the two keys. And then attention. You put your focus on this. So first, the belief and the desire. If you don't have the desire, it's not going to go anywhere. Consciousness goes. Energy flows where consciousness goes. That's it. Energy flows where consciousness goes. So if it's not your calling, if you're only mildly interested, you won't put the full effort into it. You won't be committed to a daily practice of opening your awareness and you won't go anywhere and you'll think, ah, I couldn't do it. But if you have that burning desire, you truly know it's possible for you to have a connection with your loved one because you know they cannot possibly be dead and gone. Then you will commit yourself to a spiritual practice, to living the awakened way. And along the way, so many wondrous things will happen that you can't not do it. That's fantastic. So um, I've been speaking today with Suzanne Giesman, who's a metaphysical teacher and author. And she's, you seem to be everywhere, <laughs> everywhere I look, I see so many things going on, things you're offering for free and things that you can just enroll in. And, yeah. and people are coming away with drastically different way of seeing the world. Yeah, it's it's the most rewarding thing ever. My, my husband tells people, he says, you could have been an admiral if you'd stayed in. That was not my path. And, and then a friend of mine, a dear friend, I looked and she's a three-star admiral. I went, oh my God, she got three stars on her sleeve. And then I suddenly saw this image in my mind of this little boy that I reunited with his mom here across the veil. She had, he had died at age five and, and the, the comfort that brought her. And in that moment, I just knew there aren't enough stars in the world to make up for the honor of doing this work, Steve. And, and I know, I, know I'm, I'm, I have a new mission and I'm right on track and I could not be more grateful to this team, but my earthly team, my spirit team, to you and anybody who helps us get out the word. You're just so loved. This life is not all there is. Death is not the end. We are part of something huge. And I, I just remembered you were invited to be, be one of the um, evolutionary leaders. What, what does that mean? Like what, what kind of responsibilities come with that? Or what is that? It's a group of, of people from all walks of life who are aware, who are conscious that we're on the verge of changing humanity, the way we all connect and to, they understand oneness. And we come together in different ways to do exactly what I'm doing here. Just share messages of hope. Great. That's a, a perfect last line for this interview. <laughs> messages of hope, exactly what this is. Thank you so much, Suzanne. You're welcome, Stephen. Thanks um, for I your had, work. I had, I, had a, I had a great time talking today. <laughs> Me too. Okay, so long everybody.